Today's lecture continues our series on cranial nerves with cranial nerve number five, or the trigeminal nerve. Now, the trigeminal nerve is the largest and one of the most complex cranial nerves. So we'll take this one little bit at a time and see how we do. So, the cranial nerve has multiple foramen that it passes through. It begins with its fibers coming out of the lateral aspect of the pons, and it creates a ganglion here called the trigeminal ganglion, and then it splits into three branches, hence the name trigeminal. Now, the three branches are termed the V1, V2, and V3, or the ophthalmic branch, the maxillary branch, and the mandibular branch. Now, the ophthalmic branch, V1, passes through the superior orbital fissure. Maxillary, or V2, passes through the foramen rotundum. And V3, the mandibular branch, passes through the foramen ovale. Now, on this diagram, I have omitted one of the trigeminal nerves just so that one can see the three foramina which it passes through but normally we would have a trigeminal nerve on each side. So, the trigeminal nerve is a general somatic motor as well as general somatic sensory nerve. However, only the mandibular branch carries motor nerve fibers to it, whereas all three ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular all carry sensory nerve fibers. There are multiple functions of this nerve, which include motor to the muscles of mastication, as well as sensory to the cutaneous aspects of our face, as well as um, uh, the mucosal lining in our mouth, and we will get to all of that in our next diagram. And there are many different results to the lesions, but we will go through a few clinical aspects. So, there are many different branches to the branches of the trigeminal nerve, and some of the main ones have been listed here. In the ophthalmic branch, we further subdivide it to meningeal, frontal, lacrimal, and nasociliary. The maxillary further subdivides into meningeal, infraorbital, posterior, and anterior, superior, alveolar, zygomatic, sensory roots of the pterico-palatine ganglia, and greater and lesser palatine. And in the mandibular, we have meningeal, auriculotemporal, buxal, lingual, and inferior alveolar. Now, looking at this representation, we can see how the three branches differentiate their cutaneous sensory supply on the face. So with the ophthalmic branch, V1, we can see that it innervates mostly the forehead, as well as the orbital area, and the middle nose. Whereas the maxillary, here in orange, we can see does the upper cheek, the lateral nose, as well as the upper jaw. And the mandibular covers anything below the um, upper jaw. So we have the lower jaw, as well as the chin, lower cheek, and all the way up the temple. Now taking a look at this next diagram may seem a bit scary, but we'll go through it very slowly. I apologize if some of the labeling is a bit small. I was trying to fit as much as I could on here, but these are the main branches that are need to be known. So we'll go through this one branch at a time. So here we see the trigeminal ganglion, and we have V1, V2, and V3. V1, or ophthalmic branch here in pink, its functions are to provide sensory input to the meninges, the orbit, nasal cavity lining, forehead, middle nose, and the frontal air sinus. So here we see the ophthalmic branch passing out through the superior orbital fissure, and it branches into its three main branches, the lacrimal, the nasociliary, and the frontal nerves. 
Now, the frontal further subdivides into the suprachoclear nerve as well as the supraorbital nerve, which passes out of the supraorbital foramen and provides sensory information directly above the orbit. The nasociliary continues and has some of its fibers pass through the ciliary ganglion, but does not synapse there. Mainly uses it as a highway. It gives rise to the posterior and anterior ethmoidal nerves, which provide sensory to the ethmoid bone, and it ends as the infratrochlear nerve. Now the lacrimal nerve continues on to innervate the lacrimal gland with the help of some parasympathetic fibers which come through the teropalatine ganglia from cranial nerve 7 and hops on the zygomatic nerve, which is a branch off of the V2, and then eventually hops onto the lacrimal nerve to assist in innervating that. Now moving on to the maxillary or V2 branch, where you see that it provides sensory input to the meninges, maxillary erythritis, gums and teeth of the upper jaw, as well as the bony cheek. Now the maxillary nerve passes out of the foramen rotundum and continues on where some of its fibers go through the pterygopalatine ganglia and become the lesser and greater palatine nerve. It further subdivides moving down as the zygomatic which provides sensory to the cheek area and then we have the superior alveolar branch which provides sensory to the upper jaw and then the infraorbital nerve which passes through the infraorbital foramen where it allows for sensory innervation to the skin just below the orbit. Now continuing on to our third and most complex branch the mandibular or V3 branch. Now this one provides sensory input to the meninges, mucosal of the oral cavity, anterior two-thirds of the tongue, just general sensation, and gums and teeth of the lower jaw and soft cheek and mandible. Now the motor innervation it provides are to the maxillary, buccinator, lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, tensor tympani, tensor belly palatini, mylohyoid, and anterior belly of the gastric. Now I've not included all of the uh, motor fibers uh, with the mandibular nerve only because some of their fiber courses are very short and it would have been difficult to label all of them. Okay, so even though many of these nerves have already branched prior to coming out of the foramen ovale, they are still all considered to be mandibular. So the mandibular nerves come out of the foramen ovale and the first one, the buccal nerve, comes out of here and passes through the otic ganglion, which again is from cranial nerve 7, and it has some parasympathetic fibers that hop onto another branch of the mandibular um, nerve, the auriculotemporal, where it uses it as a highway and then splits and innervates the parotid gland. Also, attached to the otic ganglion, we have the motor fibers to the tensor belly palatini. The next branch here we have the lingual nerve which continues on to provide sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and another nerve from cranial nerve number seven, corda tympani, hops on to the lingual nerve to provide parasympathetic stimulation where it enters the submandibular ganglion and there it innervates parasympathetic fibers to the submandibular gland as well as the sublingual gland and also provides some taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Continuing on with the next branch, we have the mental branch which goes through the mandibular foramen and continues on out of the mental foramen where it becomes the mental nerve and provides sensory cutaneous sensation to the chin area. Now here in red, we have the motor fibers for our coming out of the foramen ovale as the tensor tympani branch, which is a small muscle attached to the tympanic membrane in our ear, which 
tenses up when there are loud sounds to help dampen the sound so we do not go deaf. And continuing on down, we have branches to the anterior belly of the digastric as well as to the mylohyoid bone. Finally, we have the auriculotemporal branch, which eventually ends as the superficial temporal branch. And this branch provides cutaneous sensation to the area of skin just anterior to our ear as well as our tongue. Just to wrap things up, back with this diagram, a couple of clinical relevance is the corneal reflex. Now the corneal reflex is essentially if uh, there is something like a piece of dust or a, a stick heading towards your eye, you would be able to essentially blink in order to be able to avoid any type of ocular injury. Now this is a, a, a reflex that is shared between both the trigeminal cranial nerve number five and the facial nerve number seven. However, the sensory aspect or the afferent aspect of this reflex comes from cranial nerve number five. So if there is a lesion to the trigeminal nerve, then you would not be able to sense that there is a foreign object approaching your eye. The inferior alveolar nerve block, which is a technique used by dentists where they want to anesthetize your lower jaw in order to perform a surgery operation of some sort, and they will inject anesthesia into the mental foramen so that they can completely block that nerve area. And this is cranial nerve number five.